Today we're going to be reviewing the Volkswagen Jetta. Now while most car reviewers would bash this car for its cost cutting measures and styling blander than a modern day Corolla, we're going to be taking a look at what makes this Mexican built US bound German sedan so unique under the hood and underneath this vehicle. Now we're going to start under the hood of the Jetta where we have the one and only 1.4 liter CZTA engine. It's an inline four cylinder that's turbocharged and it's situated transversely for front wheel drive. Now the GLI model's got a two liter turbocharged engine. If you want to see more about it, check the link above for my GTI review. Now taking a look at the layout of some of the components under the hood of the Jetta, we've got the engine slightly off on the passenger side and the transmission on the driver's side just underneath the battery and the air box. Now further off to the corner we have the ECU and the fuse box and then down on this side here we have the vacuum pump and the coolant reservoir. Now overall the engine bay is a little bit more cluttered and tight to work on compared to its competitors like a Kia Forte or a Toyota Corolla. And we're going to start with the air intake system on the Volkswagen Jetta. It starts here at the front where we have this giant collector that's going to collect fresh air and send it down this duct into the air box which houses the air filter. It's then going to be sent down this flexible tube into the turbocharger at the back of the engine. Now the turbocharger is located next to the firewall here on the back side on the exhaust side of the engine and it's going to spool exhaust gases in order to boost that intake air that's coming in through this hose over here. That's going to create some pressure and then it'll send that pressurized air through this charge pipe to the front. And here's a closer look at that turbo charger. You can see it's just mounted right at the back of the engine. It's fairly small overall. There's no exhaust manifold. It just butts up right against the head. You can see we've got the charge pipe over here. Now because this charge pipe doesn't go to any air intercooler, just goes straight back into the engine, all the cooling has got to happen right here at the turbocharger, which means that you have these two coolant lines and you've also got oil lines that run to the turbocharger to keep things cool. Now just behind the charge pipe here we have the electric wastegate and that's just going to actuate to vent off any excess boost. Now that charge pipe is then going to feed boosted air past the sensor and then down into this drive-by wire throttle body and then into this plastic intake plenum before sending pressurized air into the engine head. Now it's interesting how the manifold absolute pressure sensor and the charge pressure sensor have these two screw holes here but they're actually just held in by plastic tabs that you could just pull right out. Now changing the air filter on a jet is quite a serious job. You have to remove a total of seven Torx screws that go all the way around this upper filter housing. It's nothing close to a toolless design like many other competitors. And once all those screws are loosened up you can remove the air filter just like that. Now getting the air box out was pretty difficult. First of all you got this weird baffle that sits at the bottom there and then the air box itself has three main bushings. Yeah that's right your air box actually has rubber bushings built into it and then even more at the bottom here we've got a drain that's going to drain out any water but it's plugged so it doesn't allow any debris to get sucked back up. It's quite a complicated air box setup. I bet you wouldn't find this on a Kia. Now with the air box out of the way you can see we've got clear access to this drive-by wire throttle body over here. There's also quite a lot of cooling and vacuum lines on this side of the engine. Over here we have the inlet that goes to the turbocharger and the outlet which is your charge air pipe that goes over to the throttle body. So now that we know how the air goes into the engine we're going to next look at the fuel system. Now the low pressure pump in the tank is going to bring gas up the gas line over here and that's going to feed it to the direct injection high pressure pump located on the intake side of the engine it's driven off of the camshaft over here. Now that high pressure pump is driven off of the cam lobes on the intake side of the engine here and it's going to pressurize that fuel because you need high pressure for direct injection. It's then going to send it through this hard line down inside of here to the direct injectors below the air intake directly into the combustion chamber. Now this engine is just direct injection only with the injectors hidden below the intake. If it had port injection the injectors would be just on top of the plenum over here. Now that could cause issues such as carbon buildup which is pretty common on the these Volkswagens. Now along with the fuel line we've also got this evap line here that comes into this purge valve located on the intake manifold. Now taking a look at the top of the engine you can see we have this metal cover. Now this isn't exactly a valve cover because it doesn't only just cover the valve it's actually a camshaft housing. So that means when you take off this camshaft cover the camshafts themselves actually come up with it as an assembly as well as a bunch of other components. Now the top of the engine we've got the oil filler which takes commonly found 0W28 oil and a physical dipstick not no sensor. I wonder why they only mention the oil type on a sticker at the front here as opposed to having it on the oil cap. I guess Castrol must have paid Volkswagen a lot to put their name there. Now spark plug access is pretty easy. It's just behind these four ignition coils located right on top of the engine. There wasn't even an engine cover here. Now also on the top here we have the PCV valve which vents directly 
into the air intake. Now down below we do have an oil separator which forms a complete PCV system. Taking a look at the underbody of the Jetta, you can see that everything is fully covered with plastic and it's flat with the exception of just a center muffler. Now that's great because it's going to protect it against salt water from corroding the underbody and it's good for aerodynamics. And of course you've got an oil leak on a new car. It's a typical Volkswagen right there. Now one downside is when you've got to do oil changes, this thing has to come off every time. There's no access ports to get to the drain or the filter. Now with the underbody removed, you can see you've got clear access to the transmission and the engine. Now on the engine side here, we have this oil pan and luckily it's made of steel. Its drain plug is located on the back here and I think that's kind of where the leak is coming from. We have this spin-on style oil filter here, which is pretty good because you just got to spin it off. There's no need for any cartridges here. We've also got the engine oil level sensor located at the bottom of the pan here. Now just above the oil filter, we have this oil separator and that acts to prevent any oil in the crankcase from making its way up through the PCV system. Now taking a look at the passenger side of the engine, we have this plastic cover here which covers a timing belt. Yeah, that's right, Volkswagen is still using timing belts in 2020, which is going to need to be replaced at some point in this engine's life. At the back here we have the exhaust camshaft and the intake camshaft at the front. Now these both have variable valve timing with the respective oil control valves located at the top here. They're not electrically actuated like some newer vehicles that use an electric motor. Now further down in front of that timing belt, we have the drive belt inside of here. You can see we've got the alternator here with the belt and its coupler. Then just behind that we have this tensioner. Now in order to slack this belt, you'd have to rotate that tensioner and then peel the belt off. Now further down at the bottom we have an AC compressor and at the back there the crankshaft. There's no water pump on this side of the engine. Now unfortunately accessing this alternator is pretty difficult with all these hoses and this intake plenum in the way. The manual actually recommends that you remove the AC compressor down below and drop the alternator down the bottom. Now looking from the bottom here, we've got this AC compressor. It's just bolted on here and it will drop right out. And then we can get access to that alternator from up above. At least there's a lot of room between the frame and the drive belt side. So you can almost do the drive belt service from underneath. Now the Jetta has two main engine mounts, one over here on the passenger side and the other one over here on the driver's side, just underneath this battery tray. Now underneath, we've also got a pendulum support that joins the subframe with this bushing here to the transmission. And that's gonna prevent it from rocking back and forth. Check out how soft these engine mounts are. This is just me jerking the bumper of the car with the car in park back and forth and you can see just how much the engine is rocking back and forth compared to the frame. And now we're going to have a listen to the engine startup sound. Now you really got to leave it up to the Germans to make things complicated. You have a wire and a hose running into the hood here. And I was wondering what that's for. And then if you actually take a look at the windshield sprayers under the hood here, they're electrically actuated and have this hose coming to them. It's so complicated to have it this way instead of having the pump do all the work at the bottom. Now this prop rod looks pretty flimsy and weak. You can see just how much the hood moves back and forth with it. I wouldn't want that dropping on my head while I'm replacing my turbocharger. Now the 8-speed automatic transmission on the Jetta is notorious for causing a grinding sound. Some people say that that's just due to a defective torque converter. Taking a look at the transmission from the top here, you've got this electrical connector that goes to the TCM module inside of here. And then further down below that, we have this cover that covers the valve body situated at the front of the transmission. Now just underneath these coolant hoses here is the starter. Now it's pretty easy to access once the hoses and this battery tray is out of the way. And you're gonna need access to this because this car has an auto start stop system that's gonna take its toll on that starter. Now the back of the transmission, you can see the shifter arm that attaches to the shifter cable. There's no electrically actuated shifter here. Now taking a look from below at the transmission, you can see we've got the valve body cover here at the front and it's made of metal surprisingly We have the transmission located over here, which is going to connect to the engine It's then going to go over to a counter shaft over to the differential at the back Now the differential housing here is then going to send power to the wheels through the CV axles on either side Now one thing I notice is how open the flex plate and torque converter is you can see right through these vent holes The teeth for the starter mode now underneath the transmission We have a drain port, but it's also a fill port now when you want to change transmission fluid you you're going to unscrew this outside part here. The whole plug is going to come out with all of the transmission fluid. Then you're going to screw back in just the outside piece and that's going to leave a hole in the middle here. Now inside the transmission there's a straw. You need a special machine to hook up to pump fluid up inside of the transmission until the straw fills over and it starts dripping back out. That's a lot more complicated than just a fill port at the top of the transmission using gravity to bring it in. Now one thing I noticed is that Volkswagen likes to use a lot of torques and triple square or 12 point style sockets. It's just something that they normally do and you're going to have to buy a new tool set 
if you're not used to working on German cars. Now it's interesting how they casted the hook into the engine head here so you can lift out this engine when you have to change it. Next up we'll take a look at the exhaust system on the Volkswagen Jetta. Now it starts at the back here where we have the exhaust side of the engine. Now there's no exhaust manifold, it just flows straight into the turbocharger from the head. Now things do get pretty hot back here, that's why you can see this heat shield. Now, the exhaust gas is going to flow out of the head into the turbocharger to spool up the charge pipe, then make a 90 degree turn this way, then another 90 degree turn down into the catalytic converter, and then another 90 degree turn back down into the flex pipe. Now continuing from underneath, you've got this flex pipe that's then going to lead down underneath this exhaust shield cover which hides the front muffler, then over to the mid muffler over there, and then out to the back. And that exhaust is then going to divert left around the fuel tank here to the left side of the vehicle over to the rear muffler. And the exhaust gas is going to exit through this rear muffler. Now the tips are facing downward and there's no fake exhaust on the back bumper so at least they're not deceiving. Now this is interesting. Volkswagen using a plastic shield here to shield the CV boot from heat from the turbocharger just above there and this exhaust pipe over here. Now taking a look across the engine, there definitely is a lot more electronics and sensors involved on this German car than much of his competition. Now you're definitely gonna need an advanced VAGCOM style of scanner to scan some advanced codes because a regular OBD code is not gonna cut it for the amount of problems this Volkswagen is gonna have. Now over here on the driver's side, we just have a regular made in Mexico battery. It's not really an AGM style battery. Just beside it, we have this ECU. Now this ECU is located under the hood and is subjected to elements and collision damage but what I do like is Volkswagen has encased it in a really nice stamped steel casing here which is going to protect it a little bit from elements and heat and just beside that we have this fuse box which is easily accessible though it's not labeled. Next up we're going to look at the cooling system on the Volkswagen Jetta. Now because this is a turbocharged engine we expect there to be a little bit of complexity. Now we're going to start here at the reservoir where we have a plastic cap that's responsible for holding pressure in the cooling system. Now the coolant is going to flow from the overflow tank into the radiator at this joint over here. Now also at this joint we have some coolant lines that are flowing outward. Some of them go to the back over here to cool off the turbocharger. We've also got some lines over here that go into this cooler that's located inside of this intake plant. Now that cooler is going to act kind of like an intercooler to help cool down some of that charged air. So instead of mounting the intercooler at the front, you're actually bringing the coolant over here to help cool it off. Now the cooling system continues on the left side where we have the upper and the lower radiator hose. You can see this one's got a sensor on it. It's then going to run through these two tubes over here into this water pump housing. Now the water pump also has two extra coolant lines that go to the heater core inside of the cabin. Now the water pump housing is made of plastic and it also houses the thermostat inside of here. Now this is one of the weak spots in some Volkswagens where these warp and eventually leak. Now even more interesting than that is that this water pump is located on the passenger side which means that under this cover here and this cover here there is a tooth belt just kind of like a timing belt that drives off of the camshaft to power that water pump. So not only do you have a timing belt on this side of the engine, but you also have one on this side of the engine for the actual camshaft. So you can see that water pump is basically trouble waiting to happen with a tooth belt and a plastic housing. At least it's accessible without taking off the timing side of the engine. Now the front here we have this electrically actuated fan. And I'm surprised there's actually quite a lot of room between the engine and this fan here. Most vehicles don't have that much space. Now removing the fan and the radiator might in fact require you to remove the front end of this vehicle because this has an integrated plastic radiator core. Now while the Jetta has a plastic radiator support, I do like that these top braces here are made of metal. And here's a look at that cooling fan from underneath. Now because this engine's turbocharged, there's a separate cooling circuit. You can see it's coming off the radiator here and that's going to go to a separate water pump here which is electrically driven. Now that's going to activate when you turn off your car to help cool down the turbo circuit. Now the headlight design on the Jetta is fairly generic but there is quite a lot of complexity that goes in behind designing this LED light. Now if we take a look at the top you can see that there's an individual surface mounted LED light that points downward on the reflector and that's going to point outward to give you your headlight. Now this headlight design is actually pretty chunky. It goes back to this much here where we have this connection for the LED lights. Now coming from the underside, if you look at the wheel well, you can see that there is an access panel to change the incandescent bulbs that may burn out. Now taking a look at the steering setup on the Volkswagen Jetta, the steering rack is mounted just above the subframe here but just below that hot exhaust pipe. Now that's not pretty good because you've also got the electric motor which is mounted down underneath here 
air. Now it's exposed to the elements and also the heat of the exhaust. So that's not going to be good for reliability. Now taking a look at the front suspension on the Jetta, we've got stamped steel lower control arms, which is just a single piece of steel bent into shape here. There's no bracing or anything. Now further down there, we've got a bolt-on style of ball joint. And up here, we have a stamped steel subframe. Now Volkswagen's complexity with 12-point sockets even continues to the wheel bolts here, where you can see they've imprinted a 12-point socket on here, even though it's just a plastic cover. It also means that you're going to need this little extra tool to pull off these caps if you're going to take off a wheel. Now to further complex things, they're still using lug bolts instead of lug nuts, which is going to make it a little difficult when you install the wheel. Now taking a look at the Jetta's front suspension, we've got a McPherson strut up at the front here. We've got a long stabilizer link that ties from the strut all the way down to this stabilizer bar over here. Now down inside of here we have this drive shaft which is actually a hollow drive shaft. Here we have the lower control arm and it's bolt to the subframe at the back here. Now this bolt is pretty easily accessible on the passenger side here. Now on the driver's side, this bolt does back out pretty close to the transmission, so you might have to either jack it up or tilt it backwards. Now taking a look at the suspension from this side, you can see the stabilizer bar mounts to the subframe over there and comes back around this way. We have the inner and outer tie rod and the back side of that lower control arm with its compliance bolt, easy to access from down below. Now one thing I don't like is that the Jetta uses a steel knuckle with a steel strut going inside here. Now in my experience, when it's time to replace the strut, these are going to rust really solid together and be very difficult to separate. A traditional design would have worked better here. Taking a closer look we have the end link tied to the strut over here and it goes all the way down. We've got this CV axle going into the steel knuckle over here and then taking a look inside of there we've got that bolt-on ball joint. Now you can see that the clearance between the CV axle and this nut is pretty tight so you might actually have to remove this axle from the knuckle in order to get that nut out. Now overall the Jetta's front suspension is pretty basic and it's going to make it cheap and easy to repair down the road although it's a far cry from the complexity of earlier Volkswagen. Now, although we do have a steel knuckle, they've gladly included a bolt-on style front bearing, so you don't need a press to change it out. Now, looking at the rear suspension on the Volkswagen Jetta, you can see where all that German engineering kind of ends, and they sort of cheaped out on the rear end and went with a torsion beam rear suspension, which is somewhat typical for this class, although the Civic and Corolla do have an independent rear suspension. Now, GLI models do get a different setup with a multi-link suspension, but the majority of Jettas are going to cheap out with this design. The torsion beam designs are the best for maintenance because there's really only two wear points at the bushings where they attach to the frame. The spring is located over here at the body and then down there on the torsion beam as well as the shock absorber bolted to the torsion beam and then up here inside the wheel well. The shocks even got this little plastic guide for when this boot comes down under full compression. And here's a look at the rear torsion beam design from underneath. You can see that the torsion beam runs from one side to the other so this is not an independent suspension. Suspension movement from one side is going to affect the other side. There also is no rear sway bar and that's because the torsion beam has some stiffness to it and acts like a sway bar. Now one of the advantages to having that torsion beam design is that you can save a lot of space underneath the vehicle. Now Volkswagen has not taken advantage of that by leaving this huge gap over here. You could easily fit a set of hybrid batteries or an extra fuel tank in here but they kind of left this area blank for people who want to swap in a GLI independent rear suspension. Now looking from the back we've got a steel knuckle but luckily we've also got a bolt-on style bearing here so you don't need a press to change it out. Now just ahead of the torsion bar we have a plastic fuel tank Now inside of here there is a low pressure pump. Now behind the right rear wheel behind this splash guard we've got the leak detection pump and the evap canister hidden behind here and also a little vent tube. Now I really do like how they've brought the flat coverings from the front all the way back along the sides here. It really is going to lend to the aerodynamics of this car and preventing it from rusting. Next up we'll take a look at the braking system on the Volkswagen Jetta. Now it starts at the back here where we have this brake booster and a conventional style master cylinder and this reservoir. Now the brake booster isn't actually driven off of the engine's vacuum that's because this is a turbocharged engine and the vacuum at lower rpm isn't going to be enough to power your brakes and so if i follow this vacuum line which is not secured very well it leads me over to this electric vacuum pump now this vacuum pump's got its electrical connector here and it's solely responsible for powering the brake booster. The EVAP system has its own leak detection motor underneath the vehicle. Now from the master cylinder, the brake lines are then going to run up underneath this cowl over here and then back over to this ABS actuator in the corner here, which is going to be responsible for the stability, traction, and any autonomous braking feature. Now taking a look at the brake setup on the Jetta, it's fairly straightforward with a floating single piston caliper here on a disc rotor. Now just make sure you've got the right fasteners for the job because we've also got 
the use of torques on the brakes as well. Now taking a look at the rear brakes for the Volkswagen Jetta, we've got a floating caliper on a disc rotor at the back here. Now this hump here looks like you do have a drum brake for the parking brake, but in fact the parking brake is an electrically actuated one located at the back here inside of this actuator. Now the build quality of the Volkswagen Jetta is surprisingly pretty solid for its class. Now on the interior here, there's a good use of a lot of soft touch-like materials and a reasonable amount of textured plastics. Now speaking of plastics, under the hood, yes, there is a lot of plastic, but the quality of the plastic is much thicker and it feels like it could take impact a lot better than some of the plastics you find in Korean cars or even modern Toyotas. Now overall, I do think the Jetta's build quality is pretty good for its class and I do appreciate all the engineering that's gone on under the hood, although we do know Although we can all agree that that engineering is probably going to lend to worse reliability and more difficult maintenance, especially with the use of all these different fasteners and tools that are required to work on these cars. Now you let me know in the comment section down below, what do you think of the Volkswagen Jetta? Do you think that its cost cutting measures and its bland styling has really brought it down in the class? Or do we both come together and appreciate the engineering that's gone behind the only affordable, small, compact German sedan offered on the market today? Now make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next car review is going to be on and subscribe for more videos just like this one.